Thank you all for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm Eric Barnes. I'm um, CEO and acting executive editor of the Daily Memphian. So we appreciate you all being at um, our uh, annual Women in Business seminar. Um, we did, our, we did this a year ago, I was realizing, because I was kind of having weird PTSD about the one we did a year ago was the first one after COVID. And I remember that mostly because I bumbled, stumbled, mispronounced, got lost, and completely screwed up that whole thing. But it was great because I had COVID as my excuse. So today when I bumble and I stumble and I mispronounce everyone's names, I just can only apologize in advance. So um, again, thanks for everybody for being here. Thanks for our sponsors and uh, our speakers. Um, a bit about Daily Memphian, um, we are, are um, we, what, we launched in September of 2018, so crazily enough, we're four and a half years old. Um, we are a nonprofit newspaper, um, news site, I guess we are technically, I still call it a paper. Um, but we um, hit a couple milestones as we go into our fifth year that I'll talk about real quickly. We just added our 40th person uh, in the newsroom, plus another 13 or 14 outside the newsroom, plus a bunch of great freelancers like Brad here and Kristen Yates, who's here somewhere, I think, who's going to be, oh yeah, Kristen's over here, hey Kristen, uh, who's a freelancer for us. So um, I want, if you're not a subscriber, I hope you become a subscriber. If you are a subscriber, thank you very much. Um, we are fully supported by, um, um, we raise money as a nonprofit to support the newsroom, but we want to be sustainable based on sponsorships and advertising and, and, and subscribers. And with the work of, and the support of people like you, we've been able to do that. Um, I'll also mention just a couple more housekeeping things. We do have a program, a journalism circle program for donors who do a thousand or more or something like that. We just recently had a great panel discussion with, uh, with Jennifer Biggs, uh, Mary Casciola, our editorial director, Jeff Calkins. If you're interested in that, just find me afterward or find one of the Daily Memphian people if you want to be a part of that. If you want to come and see if you really want to donate that much money, we'd love to have you. We'll be doing other panel discussions with, with staff members um, throughout the year. Um, and they're fun and it's interesting and for people who are kind of news junkies, it's a great way to understand more about why and what we do and for us to get great feedback from people um, as well. Um, uh, before we get started with the um, speakers, um, we'll have, oh, uh, let me also say we have three more seminars this year. We're only doing about four this year. Some years in the past we've done as being six and seven and eight, um, but we're doing three more in the fall. We'll have a small business uh, developing Memphis about, you know, construction and real estate and all that kind of stuff, and then a commercial real estate one next December. So there's no, but I think they're listed on the back, and you can probably even, you might be able to sign up for them now, but um, be looking for those um, as well. Um, let me first bring up, um, we have a couple video messages from sponsors and then a couple of folks who are here. I, actually, all the sponsors are here, but a couple of video messages and Natalie's gonna come up and help make that happen. So thank you. We often ask our clients, what's the most powerful tool you have in realizing your financial possibilities and even dreams? Well, we feel it should be your financial partner. A lot of people may not understand what a true financial partner is though, so that's why we set out to create Alia to set ourselves apart from other firms by elevating the client experience and helping them live for the possible. As a certified financial planner, I take great pride in making sure that each client not only has a well thought out financial plan at the core of their wealth strategy, but also in considering other areas related to wealth, tax strategies, estate strategies, life insurance planning, and so much more. We want our clients living and enjoying their lives. And while allowing us to play a part in their financial life, they have the confidence to know that they can live how they want, retire when they want, and create a legacy for generations to come. That's the powerful difference of a partnership. That's what living for the possible is all about, and that's the Aaliyah way. Let's take it slow. Slow, slow. Mom? Wow. Wow. And we'll check them both for free. Yes. FixFinder, the most complete free warning light report backed by technician verified fixes. That's not great. I can get him today. Get the parts fast and the job done faster. Good afternoon. I'm Paula Daniel and I serve as the practice management partner for Butler Snow. Our firm is comprised of 394 attorneys and advisors spanning 26 locations. We're thrilled to be sponsoring the Daily Memphians 2023 Women in Business Seminar, which highlights the trailblazing paths of three women who have excelled as business leaders and made lasting contributions within their organizations, industries, and broader communities. At Butler Snow, we adhere to the principle that a rising tide lifts all ships. And that's really what today is all about. We are all lifted up by the success 
of today's honorees, and their stories will inspire us to reach higher and to strive with greater purpose. More importantly, amplifying their voices and experiences will teach the next generation that there are so many different and authentic ways to lead, to contribute, and to succeed. In closing, to the Daily Memphian, we say thank you for continuing to host this very important annual event. And to the honorees, we say thank you for sharing your stories today and for lifting up so many others through your work. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Um, and we also have, uh, as I mentioned, two sponsors who are here today from Hutchison School, uh, Desay Ringer from the Hutchison School Class of 2023. Where's Desay? She's right over here. Hello. Hi. My name is Desay Ringer, and I'm a senior at Hutchison School. Up first, I want to extend a huge thank you to the Daily Memphian for highlighting successful women in business. I'm speaking to you today because our school structure revolves around celebrating strong women. We are taught, even in the youngest grades, that what we think and what we say really does matter. I am joined today by some of my classmates, and we couldn't be more excited to hear the many ways our panelists have made change in the world. Like the panelists, we want to make a difference and our teachers have always encouraged us to step outside of our comfort zones and be our best selves. Though, while Hutchison is an empowering community, there's only so much we can learn inside a classroom. We enjoy hearing from alums and other guest speakers who have already paved the way for us in the real world. But today, I'm sure we'll learn even more great things from our esteemed panel of speakers. And of course, I've already learned a lot from one of the best panelists, no offense to the rest, but my mother, Kena McCloy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being the best role model I could ever have, Mom. I love you. And now, uh, from Paragon Bank, Robert Shaw gets to follow that. <laughs> but thank you nonetheless. That's, that's a hard act to follow. Um, good afternoon. Um, Paragon Bank is so pleased to sponsor today's Women in, um, in Business Seminar. Thank you to the Daily Memphian for inviting us to partner with this great event. Supporting financial growth of women-owned businesses has been an important focus for us when we started Paragon 18 years ago. We also understand the power of women leaders because women lead several departments throughout our bank and women serve on our board of directors. Um, Paragon is a Memphis homegrown community bank and what that means for you is that we enjoy the, uh, the ease of cutting edge financial technology and services that you ex respect, expect. While trusting your banking relationship with people who take time to know you and your business and fully understand the Memphis market. I know we're in for a treat this afternoon and I can't wait to hear Lauren, Whitney and Ken share their impactful stories. Thank you from a father of three girls. <laughs> Uh, the first up today is Keenan uh, McCoy from the libraries, and I've known Keenan for since pretty much since I moved here, right? I think um, they're just stories we can't tell. I mean, none of them are particularly inappropriate, but the one I always want to tell is when I almost got Keenan arrested in rural Alabama because someone, maybe me, was driving the car really way too fast. But uh, she forgave me for that, and she's been a, 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 a she's been on behind the headlines a number. Or I think she's been on our podcast, um, so we really appreciate her being here doing this. Keenan McCoy. I actually thought I was going to get the other story, but appreciate you're not, not pulling that one out for me. So, gosh, um, this is so humbling today. I mean, to, to be amongst all you amazing women and, and change makers is, is pretty incredible. I never saw this coming, and uh, I can't thank you all enough for selecting me. I really struggled about this because I know that I am not worthy, so... Um, anyway, I appreciate everything you do, and I appreciate y'all's putting on, especially the, day, the Daily Memphian,
putting on this significant event because women are important and we're the best. I mean, what can we say? <laughs> so I don't know what all I'm supposed to talk about, but I'll go with uh, the beginning. Um, so we were asked to talk, I think, about our you know, sort of the path that we've been on, struggles, successes, things, things like that. And um, my path has been kind of unconventional, I guess you'd say. Uh, but really it created, a, I mean, I, I just ended up being able to interact with people who otherwise I never would have met were it not for the city of Memphis government. I grew up in Midtown. I was a Central Gardens child. I still live in Midtown. Um, but I knew um, that Memphis would be the home I left forever the second, you know, I gra was graduated from high school. Um, I say that because I knew that I, I attended Hutchison School and I had a great experience. It was wonderful. It was nurturing. Uh, everybody pretty much flourished. It was a happy place. Um, I still have a lot of great friends and we stay in touch all the time. And it really gave me a solid experience um, for my foundational life. So I left, uh, I left for college. Uh, and in 1986, and I went to the University of California, Berkeley. And I knew I was never coming back to Memphis because, you know, once, once I left Memphis, I was going to be somewhere else. I didn't know where. It, I mean, Berkeley was the university, but I didn't know where it was going to be, but I knew that it was not Memphis. I mean, I was fully committed to leaving forever. Uh, Memphis was kind of beat at that time, I thought, or it just wasn't cool enough, or other places were cooler. Um, but as it turned out, I started working for the student union and really became somewhat of an activist. Uh, we had protests every day because it was Berkeley. Um, and, it, <laughs> and sometimes it was, I was thinking about this, and it was like, today we're protesting apartheid. Next day is Justice Bork. Next thing is the Gulf War. Next thing is legalization of marijuana. It, it really didn't matter. Wednesdays, we were going to have a protest. Um, so everybody was an activist, and we all were always, you know, there ready at noon to protest something. And then, you know, you kind of look around and say, what are we even talking about, really? You know, I felt like it was, you know, I was like a little tiny fish, um, you know, in a huge river in a, or a huge ocean or whatever. And so when I was graduated from Berkeley, I was a history major in conservation resource studies. I was into environmental science. I wanted to be an environmental lawyer or a civil rights attorney. Um, and at any rate, I came home um, to visit, and I was going to do first month's rent, last month's rent, and a deposit so that I could get out of Memphis, because once I left Berkeley, I was, you know, Memphis was not going to be my home anymore. And uh, so. I got this great job, and it was um, at Goldsmiths. I got to hang up, hang clothes on a rack, and then put the rack, I mean, the, the hanger on the rack. And I got to do that all the time as I was getting my first month's, last month's, and deposit. And so it was, you know, not the very best thing, but uh, this was right at the point where Dr. Harrington was the mayor-elect, and he... Uh, was needed to open a transition office. And I got a call from a man named Jim Gilliland. Uh, some of you all might know Jim. And he said, I really want to introduce you to Dr. Harrington. And uh, I, think, I think you can actually help him in a way that, that nobody else can. And I was like, well, I'm 23, so I'm not really sure how much help. And then, you know, I just like was like this. I was like, oh, you know, because he's more than a foot taller than I am. And, uh, but he said, you know, can you please pull together my transition office? Can you just manage that office and, and bring it all together? And so I was like, well, I don't even know what to do. He's like, you'll figure it out. And so I was like, okay. Well, so I called my stepfather, Toof Brown, and my mom helped. Toof was a, a stationer by, you know, family. And um, like, I don't know if it was one or two days um, subsequent, but uh, one or two days later, we were on the, I think it's the sixth floor, it was halfway up the Morgan Keegan building, and that's where the transition office was. And I called him and I said, well, you know, we have phone service, fax service, you have engraved stationery, you have, you know, 
uh, a copier. We were going to do human resources kind of things. And it just seemed like, you know, I was like, I'm running this thing. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll do fine. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll, it'll work. So um, anyway, in, <clears throat> it just ended up being the most incredible experience. I mean, intentionally, the transition team was like a male and a female, a person of color, a, a Caucasian person, whatever. And so this kind of started, this got me excited, started getting me excited about being in city of Memphis government and being aware of city of Memphis government because I didn't even know that anybody did anything in city government. I didn't realize how complex and diverse the offerings were, you know. I mean, again, I was sort of a kid. I was 23. And, and uh, so Jim said, you know, you're really good at problem solving. You're creative. Uh, you know, could you, you know, make a whole lot out of this? And, um, you know, I was like, well, I'll do what I can. And so um, I did run that office and then uh, became an administrative assistant and in the, the chief administrative office, and that was a great experience. Um, I love Dave Hansen. And uh, so that was, that was a really positive thing. Uh, and then I was told that I didn't need to be an assistant. I needed to like, be kicked out of the nest and I needed to become a manager, that I wasn't meant to be a secretary or an administrative assistant. And I was happy with it, because I, I made $24,000, and I was like, I got, this is my first last, I mean, I, I was like, I was, I was truly on the way. <clears throat> but I mean, I was, I was indoctrinated in all the divisions of city government, and it was really great. Um, and so I went to the Memphis Sexual Assault Resource Center and that's a really intense place where the rape kits are and where the, you know, we had adults and children all of the time. Um, and all the, the staff there were professional. They were consummate professionals. They were either doctors, social workers, nurses, whatever. And um, the first day I got there, everybody looked at me like, who and why are you here, you know? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm the new manager, I just want to introduce myself, you know. They all walked out, I mean, it just because, you know, I was like persona non grata, and they just didn't, didn't understand how somebody who knew nothing, which is me, um, could be there. So, um, you know, everyone kind of came around and they realized that my intentions were good and that, that I did have ideas they hadn't thought of, and I also knew a lot of people in, in a, other branches of government, and uh, so we ended up really having a great thing. In fact, we won the Agency of the Year Award from the Public Services in mean, Public uh, Administration um, Agency. So anyway, so I was shunned uh, there, and then it didn't it didn't really happen much after this. But when I was appointed to be the director of the libraries. Um, there was a whole lot of conflict over that. The librarians hated me uh, because they had masters in library sciences and I did not have an MLS. Um, so again, you know, nobody ate with me in the lunchroom. Uh, you know, I was, you know, I had my own sushi or something. And so, um, but, and then I went, to, I thought, you know, I've got to do something different here. So I went to a conference, which was in Chicago um, and, this woman said, you know, how can you work? I mean, or she said, where, you know, where are you from? What do you do? And, or, or where are y'all? And I said, uh, I mean, and I described um, Memphis's thing without using the, the name Memphis. And they were like, wait a minute, are you talking about Memphis Public Libraries? That's like, a, that's a really good library. And I was like, yeah, that's where I am. And this woman said, how does it feel? To have to work for a horrible man who looks like Satan and has horns. And I was like, what is, go I said, you know, I think I'm the person you're talking about. <laughs> so, because it was widely reported in the papers that the mayor, Mayor Harrington's bodyguard was now the library director. 
And no, I mean, yes, this was published in Library Journal. Library Journal should be a, you know, you would think they would fact check, but nobody ever reached out to communications or to me, and I'm, I'm not a bodyguard. <laughs> so I talk a lot. Any of y'all who know me, it's like, just, just tell me, just wave me off. But, um, you know, anyway, it was it was really hard um, to to go because it was it was like M. Stark and and uh, so what I did was I just shut up. I mean, I just listened. I mean, I asked a million questions and people were very very patient with me and they were kind. Um, but I I represented the end of the world basically because I did not have the qualifications. So it's it definitely was difficult, um, but. I ended up having two experiences, and I'll try to make this brief. Just, I pulled up to the parking lot one day, and I was parked on the far side of the lot, and a, a man came up and s tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, uh, you, you know, there's a parking spot that says director on it. And I said, because I'd been here some weeks, I was like, I, I've never noticed that. You know, I just park, you know, in the lot, and they were like, well, you're, that's your space. And I was like, wow. And then I went down to the basement, someone was giving me a tour, and I was like trying to press the up button, and I was like, I feel like I'm in a far side commercial, I mean a cartoon or something, because no matter how many times I press the button, it's not gonna come down to fetch me. So at any rate, he said, you know, you have, you have a badge, and you can't get out of the garage, I mean, you can't get out of the basement without a badge. And I was like, huh. So I considered that a really nice act of kindness that he had, because nobody else, people would watch me and they'd go by, and only in hindsight did I see that they thought it was hilarious that I was so incompetent and didn't know about the badging system and didn't have anything. But anyway, we used to be um, a shushing place uh, that was very set in its ways, and there were never any reasons for us to have been so rude to so many residents. I mean, I don't think they meant badly by it, but they were really into rules, and no, no rule could be broken. And so um, one day, the, the head of circulation, which is the group that checks out books, you know, came over to me, and she said, um, and one of the rules was that people who check out books, so you're behind a, a desk, so you can't see anything back there, but you were required to wear stockings, pantyhose or stockings. And so one day she came and she said, um, I noticed you're not wearing stockings. And I said, I don't, I don't wear stockings. And she's like, well, you're one of us now. And that was one of these pivotal moments that just made a whole lot, uh, I mean, it just endeared me to them so much. Um, but anyway, I think that, uh, but it was one of the funnier things only because I like to break rules, I guess, anyway. Um, so, anyway, one of the things that I realized was that we did not have diversity that was necessary. We live in a city that's majority African American, and there was no reflection of that in our leadership team or in our hiring practices. And so, you know, long before there was EDI, um, we started, you know, we got busy as soon as, as we got there just to make sure that we had a reflection of our city's population. And now we have 65% um, African American, 30% Caucasian, and 5% Asian or Hispanic um, employees. And we're recruiting more um, diversity as, as quickly as we can. So one of the things we first encountered was a problem known as teenagers. And all librarians hate teenagers. I mean, if you have an MLS, you hate teenagers. So, you know, it was a huge problem. And so I went to Chicago, saw this space called U Media. It was a, a teen space. And um, it was pretty great. And it was just for teens. And you could take a little mixing machine outside and whatever. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to double down. I'm going to ask the foundation to fund a space that, you know, really kicks it up a notch. We are going to outshine Chicago, Illinois. We are not, you know, we're Memphis, we have entrepreneurialism, we have, you know, a lot of poverty, we have more creativity, you know, creative, you know, it's just, it's a city that has so much talent, 
and it wasn't being respected and it wasn't being um, sought after. And so uh, anyway, out of that, Cloud901 was born. And we got a recording studio because music is our, we wanted our brands, entrepreneurialism, uh, music, uh, art. Anyway, and so we really work in teams these days. We've all become, you know, we've really gelled together. Um, but uh, one of the things we did that was about first in the nation was eliminate fines, because we realized that everybody in North and South Memphis, $2 was the most outstanding fines that you could actually have um, in order to be able to check out a book. And so, you know, I called the mayor and I, was, I asked him, Mayor Strickland, um, I called him and I said, um, you know, we have this heat map and it shows that North and South Memphis, people can't check out books, how can they be more literate? And the mayor was like, well, he's like, of course we'll eliminate fines. He was like, why would we deprive men, women, and children of their ability to read or to learn and grow? And so right then we did it. And so we were one of the first ones in the country. And that really is powerful. I mean, and, and Mayor Strickland has been phenomenal and I just could talk about him all day, but y'all are probably like ready for me to go uh, already. But, uh, but he's been so supportive and he is a library's mayor and he's a, he's a parks mayor, he's an everyone mayor. But um, anyway, it's been a real gift to be able to do th so much with him. In uh, 2021, Memphis became the only library system in history to receive the National Medal from the Institute for Museum and Library Services um, for a second time. So this is unprecedented. We had won it um, in 2007. Um, the day before I got there, uh, I went to accept the award. That was a pretty tough moment um, because, th I mean, there was a little bit of a bullseye right here. But um, but anyway, it's it's really not me and it's not you know, anything that I've done really, it's, it's actually that we have an incredible staff and team of folks and volunteers who have supported us and you know Memphis is at the forefront, I mean people look to Memphis, people come from LA, they come from Canada, they come from everywhere um, to see what's happening at Memphis Public Libraries. So you know, I think one of the things that I know the best, and someone said this to me, I kind of was insulted by it at the moment, but um, she said, you know, you're somebody who's really good of getting out of the way. And I was like, yeah, I just sort of, I mean, I give you, I tell you what I want, and then I don't want to micromanage you. I mean, I would rather have creative minds uh, create better solutions or better, you know, have better ideas come out of them. But um, so I try to do a good job moving out of the way and not being in the way. So I think I've, you know, I could talk a long time. I just have to say there's a gym here. I know we're uh, in, in Memphis Public Libraries. It's a really special place. Uh, we've done all we can to empower um, all the staff to make decisions, to be creative, to do uh, unique and unusual things that people might not have thought of and to create access um, and eliminate barriers to access for all of our services. So um, I didn't mean to run long, um, but, but uh, anyway, if you all have any questions, we have the greatest place and the happiest, I mean, the, the staff is, is phenomenal. And uh, you know, I hope you all come uh, by and, and uh, I know you all know about Poplar White Station, that's been a heartbreak. Uh, but our staff is is uh, unbelievably resilient, and they're really um, they've everyone has pulled together, and we're doing everything we possibly can to ensure that everyone has a great library experience here in Memphis. So, anyway, thank you for having me. Next up here is uh, Lauren Reedy from uh, owner and principal storyteller from Forever Ready Productions, who also we put to work today, which she can tell that story. So anyway, but thank you for being here and thank you for working also. Um, first off, let's give it up for Keenan and that wonderful leadership. <laughs> the Memphis Library is definitely no longer a shush zone. My four and a half year old is proof of that, and it's a welcoming, wonderful place. So thank you for you to you and your team for the leadership of making 
all of our libraries something that the rest of the country looks at. That, that's quite an accomplishment. I'm going to take you back in time. No, I have not invented a time machine, but pretend, okay, pretend. I'm going to take you back to a time where I was a young, eager journalist who'd just been assigned a story at juvenile court. And if you've ever been to juvenile court, I won't ask, but cameras are not allowed. Why? Because to protect the identity of the children that are behind closed doors. On this day, I was assigned to cover the hearing, the court hearing for the Kroger mob attacks. Who remembers those? Yes, exactly. They made national news. I also had the pleasure of covering the initial story that made national news and the video that went viral outside of the Highland Kroger. On this day, though, I was by myself, as often occurred, with a camera in the car that I couldn't take in, and I had to cover the case. It was a hearing about what happened that day. And on that day, the suspect took the stand and the victim took the stand. Again, remember that cameras aren't allowed, so I'm sitting in the back and you can feel the tension in the courtroom because both sides of the case are involved. On one side, you've got all of the victims in the case. On the other side, you've got the suspect. The victim took the stand and said he was traumatized from the incident and when he closes his eyes, he still remembers getting kicked in the head and a pumpkin hitting his head. I was getting angry. Then the suspect took the stand, and the suspect said that he did all of this to impress a girl. Exactly. So I got done with the court hearing, and quite honestly don't even remember the results of the court hearing, but I walked out of the courtroom and I was fired up. And as I watched both sides walk out into this hallway, I saw the victims and the suspect family members get close. And the suspect's mother leaned into the victim's father. Now, I've covered a lot in Memphis, so I was bracing myself for some kind of confrontation. And instead, she leaned in and she said, I'm so sorry for what my son did to your son. And I wish he was here right now to apologize in person. I braced myself. And he leaned in and said, Tell him I forgive him. Tell him I forgive him. Excuse me? No cameras are allowed. No one's captured this moment. I'm watching it all unfold. So I run out to my car, grab my camera, run to the, the exit, and ask if someone will do an interview with me. Who doesn't love doing an interview on camera on the worst day of their life? Anyone? Anyone volunteering for that? So I ran back to the newsroom and I said, oh my gosh, we have, this is the headline. I just witnessed a moment of forgiveness in the hallway of juvenile court and the city has got to know about this because raise your hand if you saw that incident and it made you feel uneasy. It's okay, it made me feel uneasy. I wanted the whole city to know that even though this happened, there was this moment of forgiveness in the hallway. Well, this was the only line in my story that night, preceded by tabloid-like testimony about how he did it all to impress a girl. And as you can imagine, I was very disappointed when that story did not go viral like the original story of the, fight, of the video that went viral across the nation. That was the beginning of the end of my television career. I still had time left in my contract, but from that moment on, I vowed to start telling stories that were beyond the headline, not to steal your show. <laughs> I vowed to tell the untold stories. I wanted people to see moments like that in a city that I believed in. And about 18 months later, I quit. My contract ended, and I started a new venture. But in order to explain that, i got to take you back in time, because I know you're all thinking, wow, you've aged a lot since that time. No, this is me, 17 years old, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's where I'm from. That's why I talk kind of funny. And that is me inside the studio of uh, the ABC affiliate at my high school. I was 17 years old, and I got a job as a production assistant. This was back before cameras were robotic. People don't actually have this job anymore. I ran cameras and scripts and tapes, beta tapes, up to master control. And by the time I was a senior in college, I was reporting live for that station during the Friday night football season. I was so excited. I hated being on TV, but I loved the excitement of live television. 
And I continue to do that for the next decade. And I just picked these because they're some of the great highlights. I got to cover a lot of national news, but my favorite stories were the local ones, even though none of them are posted here, except, of course, getting your bread and milk when it's going to snow. I look thrilled. I was. Trust me. But I also got to cover some really beautiful things, like the inauguration of President Barack Obama the first time, and the Memphis concert that happened in the White House in 2013. And I got to cover the Tigers when they went to the tournaments, and the Grizzlies when they were in the conference finals. And that is something that I truly do miss. But there was a point that started in that juvenile court hall that I realized it was wearing on my soul. I was tired of reporting live from crime tape and not doing anything beyond that. Going home, going about my business, but never getting the chance to follow up or dive deeper into the problem of the crime. And so, in 2016, I left. In 2014, I had decided to start a side hustle. Does anybody in the room have a side hustle? It's a kind of a Memphis thing. <laughs> the only reason I started an LLC, all the lawyers in the room will appreciate this, is because I didn't want to get sued. And if I did, I wanted to make sure that my practices were separate from my personal assets. And so we started an LLC in 2014 just for that reason. I had no intention to take it on full time. Two years later, March 1st, 2016 was my last day on air. The reason why there are color bars there is because that is exactly how my career ended. <laughs> on election day, in the middle of my live shot, telling you nothing important about a polling place that had a minor issue in the morning, the live shot went to color bars and my sentence was cut off purely not on purpose, just pure accident and technology, but it was quite a metaphor <laughs> for the end to my television career. Move on. So the very next day, uh, I started working full-time at Forever Ready, and by 2016, December of 2016, I'd done six figures in revenue solo. It sounds really impressive, but I knew I couldn't keep it up or I would burn out, just like I had almost done in my previous life. So in May 2017, hired my first employee and an intern. And you can see the rest of the timeline. I think a really important thing to note here is that our son was born in 18. And it was also the same year that I hired a coach. Highly recommend that. And then um, we expanded to Chicago in 2020, before the pandemic, if you're wondering. If I had known that, I'm not sure we would have done it. But they're still there and thriving. So this is a little bit of what's happened since then. And I can't do it without my team which is why they're up here and, and over here <laughs> running cameras today. Um, and you touched on it. it. It's so much about the people you surround yourself with. And my team makes me a better leader, a better storyteller. They up our value in why we do what we do. And I couldn't do it without them. So they deserve an entire slide. And I adore them. And we're an all-female crew at the Women in Business event today. So I'm super proud of that, too. Something that I think is really important in life is to define core values, both for your business and for your personal life. Well, because I own a business, my core values also are my business core values. They are service, collaboration, creativity, and efficiency. That all seems pretty straightforward, but really means a lot and drives what we do. Service isn't just serving your client, but it's about meeting the needs of the community. In 2020, we spun up a live services uh, division. Why? Because the needs of the community were to reach people virtually in really impactful ways. Collaboration, same thing there. Working together to make a better story, tell more about our community. And I was in journalism, so of course efficiency is one of my, my things. We've got to get it done by deadline, right? right? Everybody who's a journalist in here knows that. Um, these are a couple of the clients we've worked with. There's some folks probably in the room. Memphis Botanic Garden is one of them. Um, but what I really want to tell you about is some of the stories that have really impacted me and made me realize that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I hope that you walk away reminded that same thing in your shoes. I used to stand outside the hospital. How many of you have seen a live shot outside of Regional 1? Everyone, right? And uh, how many times have you heard them say, the victim was transported here behind me in critical condition? Well, now I get to go inside the hospital and tell the stories of the people who were in critical condition and had their lives saved by the amazing, talented doctors, nurses, and staff inside our Level 1 Trauma Center. This is a story of a man named Corey Levy. I covered Corey's story when I was a reporter at Channel 5. He was a pizza delivery driver who was shot and robbed for $7. And he did a story with me after the suspects were captured. 
And then I moved on. As journalists do, I covered thousands of stories. And the very first client I worked with when I left the news was Regional One. And they said, Lauren, we want to surprise a patient, or surprise a doctor with a patient saying thank you. So I sit down and I go to interview this guy, and it's Corey Levy, who I covered in 2013. I had no idea until we sat down to do the interview that was the same guy that I covered in that time. And so we got to capture this beautiful moment of him thanking doctors for saving his life. Not only did that close the loop for him, but it reminded the doctors before they were burnt out in 2020, it reminded them so much about the importance of their work. And this video ran at the gala and they raised a record $140,000 in the room. That is a full circle, beautiful moment of something that's happening every day here in Memphis. And the other story I wanna tell you before I wrap up is about Lee Evans. Anybody here familiar with the Carpenter Art Garden? Love that place, just around the corner from our new offices on Broad Avenue. The day after I left news, March 2nd, I went to dinner with a friend. They said, well, what are you gonna do now? And I said, I don't know, I've never run a business before, I've never done this. And he said, well, what's a story you always wanted to tell as a reporter that you, you never got the chance to tell? And I said, I know exactly who that is. It's about the Carpenter Street Bike Shop. So a few days later, I went to the bike shop and I started chronicling their new bike training program. And over the course of a couple of weeks, made a documentary about Lee. Got to showcase the impact of his work and what he's doing. He still works there to this day and is now in a leadership position and really leading the community. What is really cool about this story is that it wasn't perfect. It was the first story I did post news um, and it went on to go to the Indie Memphis Festival and it won. Even better, and I tell this because sometimes we have dreams that we, we move on from, right? When I was a journalist and a TV journalist, I wanted to be an Emmy Award winning TV journalist. So it was just something, just like this thing, you know, to say I won an Emmy and I'm, I'm an Emmy Award winning journalist. So when I left news, I sort of gave up on that dream. It's not gonna happen, that was a neat, you know, nice try, good job, you had a good career, next career. Well, this story went on to win an Emmy, the first Emmy we won. And that trophy there from the Indie Memphis Festival lives at the bike shop for them to remember the power of their own story. And I share this with you because this story almost wasn't told because it wasn't perfect. I shot it myself, there were pieces missing, but a good old fashioned deadline submitting it to the festival and then to the Emmys is what got the story out there and did more than I'll ever be able to know or explain. So kudos to Lee for all the work he's still doing. And just to wrap things up, because I know I only have about 10 minutes, trying to be respectful of your time. Some of the things that I've learned in the last seven years doing this is to have a clear vision and make sure that you communicate that vision to others. If you don't, then they won't get on with you and come with you along the way. It's not as effective. The second thing is to define core values. I talked about that. They really drive me. The two things missing from my business core values that are in my personal are faith and family. And I still carry those into everything that I do. And they sort of are like a compass. Another thing is success doesn't look the same for everyone. I learned this the hard way. And I'm reminded to reward people for things that they're proud of and, and what success looks like for them. But I'm also reminded not to spend too much time in this place that I call Comparison Canyon. Anybody been there? <laughs> where you stand and you look out and see what everyone else is doing and then suddenly feel inadequate or like you're not doing enough. Success looks different for everyone in this room. Uh, find your zone of genius. Figure out what you're the best at. Delegate after that. Keep dreaming. I didn't think I'd ever win an Emmy after I left and, and here we are. You can reimagine what your dream looks like. It's not failing if you change course. And in the words of Jeff Squires, my dad who's here, just be yourself. That is all. People will like you for who you are. And with that, I got to show you who I am. This is my family. That's my, my son, Max, who has the flu today. So my husband isn't here. Um, and we really, all of the stuff that I've shared with you, it's, it's now about this. It's about creating memories, building a family. That's what it's all about. So thank you so much for having me. And thank you to the Daily Mem fan.
Thank you. That was great. I should have. I forgot to do logistics. We will do Q and A after we, um, oh, Whitney speaks, uh, and uh, we'll get questions from you all. And then you can, you know, to, to whatever degree possible, talk to them afterward. Let me also. I should, this is Natalie Van Gundy. She produces these events. She produces behind the headlines. All the podcasts we do, the Spot News. If you hear that on WKNO and WYXR, that is all. Um, Natalie Van Gundy, so thanks very much. And all um, the other folks, uh, Carrie O'Gwen and Janice Jenkins and Heather Marion and Angel Reeves and Mamo Hawkins, who all put this on, I notoriously show up about 15 minutes early. I'm like, this is looking great. Wow, this thing is a piece of cake. So thanks to all of them for making this possible. But now, our last but not least, Whitney Trotter. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll do like how the Baptist preachers say, I won't be long, but I'll go strong. Because uh, I know y'all are probably eager to get to the panel. Um, but yes, my name is Whitney Trotter. I am one of the few duly licensed registered nurses, registered dietitians in the state of Tennessee. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my business, Bluff City Health. So I ironically landed in Memphis by way of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I know, it's very strange. Um, I played at Kirkwood. So, I know, so strange. Um, so, my dad is one of 14, um, and everybody is, a, is an athlete or the military in my family. And my senior year, I got an amazing scholarship to the Air Force Academy. So, I actually went up there, toured in Colorado, and then unbeknownst to me or my family, I had a peanut allergy. So, I actually lost my $250,000 Air Force scholarship uh, three weeks before school started in August. And my dad is former Air Force, so he was sad. I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? Uh, so, the basketball coach from Kirkwood in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I had never heard of it, called me and he was like, hey, I've seen your tape. Um, I want to offer you a scholarship. When can y'all get to Iowa? And I was like, uh, let me go ask my parents. So we drove up to Iowa, got to play two years uh, junior college. We were one of the best junior college uh, teams in the nation and got recruited at Tennessee Martin. And it was at Tennessee Martin I discovered my love for nutrition and HIV. One of my professors, uh, she's Nigerian, she would study, she would go back to Nigeria every summer and study HIV in women and children. And I was like, wow, I want to do that. Um, I really hadn't known a whole lot about Memphis. We would, I'm from Austin, Texas, and so at UT Martin, you know, we'd either drive to the Memphis airport or the Nashville airport to fly out for our games. So I told her, I was like, I think I want to be an HIV dietitian. And she was like, okay. Um, and so I applied to the University of Memphis, and I called St. Jude, and I said, uh, can y'all hire me? And they were like, no. And I was like, okay. I said, but I really want to study HIV. That's what I want to do. And so thankfully there's a dietitian that was there, knew some people and she was like, if you get into University of Memphis, you can do your graduate assistantship with me in the children's HIV clinic. And I was like, okay, wow. So I told my parents, I said, I'm moving to Memphis. Um, and my dad was like, what? Like first Iowa, now Memphis? He was like, I thought you were coming home. And I was like, I thought so too. And still, my husband and I are still here, so never made it back to Texas. Um, and so I went to grad school at University of Memphis and just fell in love with just the community of Memphis. And it was really interesting, after I finished uh, up at St. Jude, I got the job opportunity to work at, uh, which is now Regional One Health, in the adult HIV clinic. And I learned so much. Um, I was 23 and I thought I was gonna save people with HIV and AIDS and quickly learned that it was people with the diagnosis and the illness that taught me so much. And one of the things I really started noticing was I started hearing this thing called eating disorders. And if any of you are familiar with disordered eating, eating disorders, when you think of the picture, you, really, you think of thin, affluent white women. Well, that was, that's not the majority of the population I was serving in Memphis. And so I kept noticing these beha uh, behaviors, these patterns, uh, but nobody was talking about it. Nobody was talking about HIV and the black population and the Latin community, or specifically with people with infectious disease. So um, I called up another place. That's how I've gotten all my jobs. Um, and I said, you know, I just need somebody to kind of train me so I can figure out, you know, what to do in HIV. And also at that time, I got really interested in human trafficking and um, four friends, uh, four friends of I, we started Restore Core, which is a um, trafficking organization in Memphis. 
And so I said, I just really think we're missing a population of eating disorders with victims of sexual abuse and HIV and other infectious disease. And I remember somebody telling me that, uh, they, they specifically told me, Whitney, eating disorders doesn't happen in that community. And I said, well, I, I disagree, but okay. So um, I was working out at the uh, Rape Crisis Center and I was working with several nurses and um, they were like, I think you should go back to nursing school. And I was like, okay. So I told my husband, I was like, my husband was working for Memphis Athletic Ministry at the time and I said, I think I wanna quit my job. He was like, okay. Uh, I said, I think I wanna go back to nursing school and he was like, okay. Uh, so I went, I was fortunate, I got in at UT Health Science Center, went through nursing school, um, got a job at Le Bonheur, called again. Um, I think I went up there every day and they took mercy on me and called and finally hired me. Um, and I worked in the emergency room for years at Le Bonheur and I loved it. But I knew I was missing, we, we had so much trauma, but nobody was really working with families on the after effects of trauma. And I was seeing eating disorders. And I was seeing how we were handling kids that came in that were uh, sexual assault victims. And I just was like, I, I, I think I need to go back to school again. And uh, my husband again was like, are you sure? And I said, I think so. Um, and so I said, but you know what? I really, I really wanna work in eating disorders too. And so thankfully, again, UT took mercy on me. And, and I, I was at a treatment facility working there, 2019. I decided to quit. I knew 2020 I was gonna apply to school. And I said, I'm gonna open up my own practice. And at that time, there were no black providers in the entire state working at eating disorders. And so thankfully, several therapists, friends of mine, I said, I'm gonna start my own job. And they said, okay, we're gonna refer people to you. So 2019, I started Bluff City Health, had no idea how to start a business. I think I Googled like 10 best principles, found how to do an EIN number online, and then 2020 hit. And um, 20, I'll never forget, spring break 2020, I, I just was feeling so sick and like fatigued, and I went to the doctor, she ran a bunch of tests. Um, my husband and I decided to take a vacation, and so my parents, like, you know, we'll watch, we'll watch MJ, that's my daughter. We're driving, I've never been to New Orleans, we're driving to New Orleans. This is spring break 2020, my nurse practitioner calls me and she says, Whitney, you have lupus. And I was like, what? She said, you need to come back. She said, you need to come back, we need to figure out what medication we're gonna get you on because we're about, this pandemic is real. So I was like, well, I'm on vacation. She said, you gotta turn around. So I kid you not, we drive down to New Orleans. The, the city shut down. We drive six and a half hours there, we eat dinner um, at a gas station, and then we drive back to Memphis the next day. And so I was like, how am I gonna pivot? And, and she was like, you know, you can't, you can't be a nurse right now. She said, you, you really gotta go in isolation, you really have to figure out what to do. And I said, well, I got a business to run. And she was like, I'm sorry. So I had to figure out not only how to be a woman of color and a predominantly white field, but also what was I gonna do mental health? Nobody knew what was happening mental health. COVID was ramping up. So I had to figure out how to scale to Zoom. If anybody knows me in real life, I'm terrible at technology. And so in the midst of that, I had gotten accepted at UT. 2020, the fall comes and I finally, you know, figured out all the telehealth. My business is up and running. Um, I start school. And what was so interesting at the time is I had my business being a dietitian, working in nutritional counseling, eating disorders, but I was still a nurse. And so as school starts, you know, we're nurses, we're going into the hospitals, COVID is at the all time high, coming home, changing in the garage. I mean, it was just wild. My sister-in-law died middle of August. My grandmother died uh, shortly after. And I was trying to figure out with business, and this is a thing that a lot of people, it's hard, right? As, as a woman particularly, we're still caretaking. So how do you run a business through grief, trauma, and, and tragedy? Well, I ended up opening an Instagram account and started connecting with other mental health professionals, started building community. And again, at that time in 2020, there were only three black dietitians in the entire United States that were doing eating disorders and less than 3% of dietitians in the US are black. And so I was like, well, I do wanna be a nurse practitioner, but I also wanna figure out what's going on with COVID. We're talking about inflammation, people are trying to figure out this functional approach. 
I see my community. It's, at that time, it was really, really hitting the black community. And being in Memphis, uh, there were all these intersecting things. And so ironically, social media for the win. Um, I started a social media account. And from that, we actually uh, formed a eating disorder peer group. And I think so far we've trained 250 professionals of color to recognize eating disorder screening diagnosis. Um, oh, thank you. And so we spent 2020, 2021 doing that. Um, and then I had a personal tragedy where I gave birth and lost my daughter. And oh, I said I wasn't going to cry because I didn't wear waterproof mascara. Um, and so my husband asked me at the end of 2021, he was like, what do you need? And I said, I need a distraction. And he was like, okay. And I said, I think I'm going to plan a conference. And he was like, okay, but you're not quitting school, right? And I said, no. <laughs> I was like, no. I was like, I'm graduating December 23. I said, but I got to plan a conference. And so again, at that time, you know, it was the height of the pandemic, racial and social unrest. And I called 10 friends and I said, I'm gonna plan the first BIPOC eating disorder conference. And we did, and we, I think we had 580 people from around the world. Uh, we had over $200,000 in sponsorship, which was wild. And it was the first international conference for people of color specifically designed to train educational ed people who in the education, teachers, doctors, nurses, therapists, on how to actually screen, assess, and recognize eating disorders in unrepresented communities. And I'm just really proud of that. Um, so, yeah. so um, we're, we're gearing up for year two, and when Natalie asked me to speak about this, I was so nervous because I was like, I cannot do a PowerPoint and speak at the same time. Uh, technology is not my friend. But I did just, it's hard. It's hard being a, a, a business owner, especially when you start in a pandemic. Um, it's hard being a business owner when you don't have community or people that share similar identities as well. But what is really interesting, you know, one of the things that the pandemic did show us was the power of community, even the power of virtual community. And so a lot of what my business has been able to do with the mentorship um, is really connecting people, connecting people that share similar identities, faith, religion, gender, ethnicity. And so that's, I'm really excited to see more people take up that space when it comes to business. So that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this is always back to the old daily news. Some folks have been here. I shouldn't say it's that old, but it was old. Um, the Women in Business Seminar was always the, the best one we do, and I appreciate everyone just telling your story and sharing. And um, you know, if we did a guys in business one, it would all be about you know not people sharing probably. So that's sort of changed a little. Uh, one nice thing about getting old is you get to surround yourself with uh, types of people that you want to instead of the people you don't. So um, my friends share. My guys share. What, um, the, the, I don't know where to start. Um, I'm curious, I'll go with Keenan first. W was government, this is kind of a rudimentary question, but I'm curious, because I knew you, I've known you for 25 years now. Um, was government actually a welcoming, oddly welcoming place for women? Or was it a, I mean, you had a very difficult go of it that was very much about being young, it sounds like, right, and new. But was government, was it also being a woman? I mean, was that just the subtext the whole time as well? Well, I mean, it was, it was male dominated for sure. I mean, every aspect, there were very few um, women who were on the leadership team and you know, that were heads of divisions and things like that. Um, I never experienced a problem with that, but I know that, um, I mean, or people didn't treat me poorly because I was a woman. Uh, they, it was sort of because I was young because I walked into a position effectively and you know it was a position that a lot of people would have wanted and so it was I think it was more that I was the youngest person to come on pretty much yeah. in the administration um, rather than someone who was older yeah and for Lauren for news I mean is it just a bizarre business I mean, it's very, just, it's very bizarre. TV news particularly. I ruined I'm, the microphone yeah, setup, yeah. by the way. Right. Don't worry, I'm a professional. <laughs> so, so part of the joke here, you sort of alluded to it, but with Scott, your husband was supposed to be here and doing all this stuff, and you were just going to be panel, and then he 
went and got the boy because yeah. the boy is sick. Well, actually, Grandpa went and got the boy, oh, and then Grandpa Scott went, went and got the boy, and okay. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so we don't always make our speakers work, um, <laughs> and you don't have to work to be on the panel. Yes. Um, what was news like as a woman? As I mean, was it Wild West kind of terrible? I mean, I mean, I've been around, I've never been in local TV news, commercial TV news, but I mean, I've been around some of those people, and they're it's a kind of a difficult yeah, environment. Yeah, it's it's very. So I was young and eager, um, and I'm glad I didn't know what I know now because I I was like anything is possible, and I was going to be the next Katie Couric or Aaron Andrews. Either would have worked fine for me before any of the scandals on any either side of their stories came out. I was so excited and eager, so I dove in, um, and I was young and happy and optimistic. So I did get, I had a hard time. People always questioned whether I knew what I was talking about, and sometimes I didn't. Um, but I always acted like I did. And, um, you know, my dad said, just be yourself, and he all, my parents both said, you know, girls can do anything guys can do. And so when I was covering sports, I knew their names and said everything. I had to know triple what the guys knew, but I could talk sports. Um, and I just kind of always had to level up just a tad to like be there. And um, if I screwed anything up, it was under a microscope. So, yeah. But it honestly kind of fueled me, which I don't know if that makes me messed up or not, but I was like, okay, tell me I can't do something and I'm gonna do it, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Really, I don't have a question. I just think you, Whitney, need to get busy. I mean, you're just not, you're not doing enough. I mean, really, come on. I don't know. Um, no, it's amazing. Your story's amazing, and thank you for thank you. sharing all that. Um, the, I mean, I, 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 do you see a change in this lack of representation of dietitians and a lot of what you're doing among the black community? I mean, is it people going, oh, wait, I could do that too? I need to get in there? I mean, and again, you're, you're obviously now reaching people far outside Memphis and all over the place. Do you see sort of positive change that way based on what you've done? Oh, absolutely. And I think the more that we destigmatize mental health, and um, that's a lot of it too, is, is, is using language that different communities identify with, but um, destigmatizing mental health. But we definitely are seeing a shift, which I'm, I'm really encouraged and proud to see. Yeah. It is fine. I joke about my, my kids are 23 and 24, and, and it's like my, my mom, you know, who's since passed away, but my mom, you know, she was 30 years older than me. Um, one time a doctor said to her, she's had all these ailments, and, you know, my brother and I are like, Mom, you really just need to see a therapist. You've had a really rough life. You deserve a therapist. Like, but she just went, and one time a doctor said to her, I think what you're really having is you really need to see a therapist. And she said, and she told me the story, you're telling me all this is in my head and she stormed out of this doctor's office, right? My dad still needs to go to therapy at 85 and he won't, and it's just, we're, it's kind of a lost cause. My generation, or me, you know, it's, I always joke about my friend Mark, the therapist. And so, but my kids, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like they are, they talk the language of therapy, they talk about therapy, their friends talk about therapy, and it is this huge change. Do you see that though with older people like me? Oh, well, Not um, so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is interesting. I, yes and no. I, I do think that um, the older community is starting to embrace mental health more. Um, I think for teenagers, it's just more accessible. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, um, you know, there's a lot of harms and dangers. And so I think it's, it is hard. There's an accessibility factor with different generations. But I think we are seeing, um, people in the older community are starting to prioritize their mental health in ways uh, post-pandemic than they ever have before. Yeah, it, the, the, you mentioned um, how enabling Instagram was for you and social media, but for all the parents at the table, I mean, they're just, what some study recently came out in the last week, Instagram, and just a tremendous tragic numbers about the feelings. If you didn't see this, it's yeah. painful to read, but of, mm -hmm. of, of feelings of suicide, feelings of low self-worth, particularly among young women. And so, I mean, your daughter's here, so I don't mean to put you in a bad place. We have two daughters, two, mm -hmm. two, and it's, it's a challenge, right? I mean, it's a challenge as a parent, so. Any, Absolutely. <laughs> and you, you got, I mean, you're a ways from this, I assume. I hope so, gosh. <laughs> yeah, okay. But um, I, think, I think it's worth acknowledging. I, I said Comparison Canyon for a reason. Um, and that's, if you don't know, if you're not familiar, it's where you stand and look at everyone else's things, and social media does that. You can have a great day and then log on and see someone else did 10 things more than you and wrote about it, um, yeah. and it could really impact you. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. important to acknowledge no matter what age you're in. 
I had 500 people at a conference and raised $200,000. But anyway. Also uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you cheer for those people because you're you excited cheer, for them. You do. You, do, you cheer for those people. Questions. Uh, raise your hand. Any questions specifically for people? Over here. And again, speak up just because of the weird acoustics. Yeah. Um, what is the floor? Yes. Um, Did everybody in the back hear that okay? Yeah, did, okay, thank you. Well, I believe in mentoring. I mean, I think that that's one of the most critical things that we can do for either new hires or for people who uh, want to go to the next level, like say they're in an entry level position and the, the lowest grade or whatever. Um, to whatever extent you can expose them, take them around. I used to do happy hours with the director with no alcohol um, and just so we could have a conversation with people who are like, you know, I'd really like to do this. So we do a lot of cross training. Um, we do um, create a lot of opportunities for people to be able to uh, go with another, you know, shadow other people. Um, I think that, you know, I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have more than one mentor. And, and that's just a critical role because they can give you all the, whoever they are, they can give you all the ins and outs and they can tell you what might help you to get to your next step, um, whether it's male or female. Uh, so I, I think that, that um, the best thing you can do is, is like raise your hand and say, would you be willing to take me on as a mentor or a mentee, you know? Because um, you do have to take some action on your own. You can't, you know, you have to take the initiative. And so, uh, I mean, I had, I had great luck with people who, who really taught me so much. I, I, I never could have done anything I've done as of today were it not for these individuals. But there are tons of people who, are really, who really love to do that. They love to share either their story or how they got where they are. And you look at them and you're like, well, you're a doctor. So, I mean, like, of course you. Not me. You know, <laughs> No, I, I know. I, I was looking. I didn't mean to be looking through you or anything. <laughs> close, close, right? Close. Yes. Please. But you know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be somebody who's like so many steps beyond where where you are. But you know, if you start, I mean, starting is the the biggest part, and and that's one of the things that we do with we offer up to you know all of our staff, just trying to get them exposed because they think, oh, I'm just in this agency or this part of the library or whatever um, and, and really you know it doesn't I mean it, it, it's designed to go well beyond that and so you know but but you have to take the initiative I mean because otherwise you know people don't know exactly what you want from them and just kind of be clear whether it's a, a lifetime a lifetime not to say strategy but like plan or if you just want to get to the next thing or if you want just to have some interaction with somebody else that could connect you with someone else. Um, but, but you do have to kind of insert yourself because people are willing to do it if they know you're serious or that, that you actually want to do something different. But if you, if they're, you know, if you're just gonna be feeling them out for like, for them to drum up ideas, you know, you, you've gotta have some kind of idea of what, what it is you're looking for that you can communicate to them and then that'll make it easier for them to actually take the ball and run with it. Yeah. Hey, thank you all so much. This has been such great presentations. Two things that always makes me think about just um, that as women, sometimes, more you and I talked about this the other day, and Jan and I talked about it a little bit, but as women, to devalue our skills and our experience and what we bring to the table and kind of do that thing where you go, oh, that's nothing, it's just like you into existence. And do you struggle with that and how do you sort of mentally play that game with yourself? And then the other piece is just finding balance. We all experience it, but I think as women, we sort of feel it in a different way, and how you guys are managing that in your decision. Sure, who wants to go first? Thank you. Okay. Um, how to manage, well, I'm not managing it. Um, it's hard. Uh, we don't have a lot of family here, and so uh, my mentor is here in the back, Erica Conley. Um, and so I think that's 
you know, how Keenan mentioned finding mentors, but also finding people that can um, step in and help. You know, again, when COVID hit and being a nurse, we really had to rely on um, our family and friends to kind of help to step in, help shoulder the burden. Um, but I agree with you. I think sometimes there is this um, kind of tendency to be like, oh, I'm just doing that. Uh, oh, that's nothing. And so I've really tried to retrain my, myself to remove the word just um, because I feel like it devalues what I'm bringing to the table and the, the attribute. So I think that's one way, but it is hard. I, I don't ever pretend to have it together. Um, we do have a six-year-old and her kindergarten teacher texts me every week because I have forgot something uh, to bring, to sign, you know, so it is hard. Uh, but I, I was looking up an article earlier and it said that women in business, not only do they give more than men, but we actually give more um, the dollar amount as well. And so that's also very empowering of we don't always have to have it together, but we always do give and bring more. Amen to that. <laughs> um, I've adopted saying and not but like about that. all of those, both of those questions. Uh, for me, especially balancing. You saw in the timeline, nothing happened in 2019. It's because I was my first year as a parent. I just like survived and my business was still surviving, you know? So it, it, the balance is hard and the mental load on a woman is much harder. Who got the call today about our son? Me. My husband and I co-parent, but it, it always sort of defaults. And I love being like, well, Scott's coming to pick him up, but it was actually grandpa. But it, the burden often falls on the woman and then like I said you have to kind of be you know you have to be a, a little bit above with your knowledge the same thing is it's fine it's actually kind of cute if a dad has to leave a panel because their kid's sick but if a mom has to leave the panel or work or anything it's like she doesn't have it together why don't we have why don't we have it together and so there is that burden and I hate that that exists so I've adopted the and not the but because I can be a mom and a business owner and I can be a badass and not have it together. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So yes. it's and not but. I, love that. I think I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, I'll say because uh, to say my daughter who you all heard from earlier, uh, she's amazing and she's brilliant and she's you know, and these other uh, Hutchison uh, students are, you know, I, I mean, I'm almost afraid of social media because of what y'all were talking about. I mean, I just don't get on it. I mean, I'm more, I'm closer to a Luddite than I am on Pinterest and Instagram and TikTok. I don't, I don't do that. TikTok is chasing me. They want me to answer, I mean, open their <laughs> files, but, but, um, but I do, I, I am concerned about it. And, and as a single person, um, you know, both of my kids, I'm not speaking for uh, to say, but, you know, I've, I have had to choose work over my children uh, more than infrequently, depending upon, especially depending upon who I was reporting to. And, you know, it leaves me with the little, uh, she's going to, she's going to go ahead and finish that for me, I think. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, agreed. Seventeen. I mean. She's seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> First thing, I. I, I <laughs> we. we <laughs> 
I don't know which I don't know which one it was. So you got to narrow that down. I tend to respond. It's a weakness. <laughs> Wait, I don't. Even, I don't even know which one you're talking about. So, but um, no. But t the the first question you had, I think, was, are these males? In, you know, it, right now the city of Memphis has, and I'm really proud of of uh, the team here and the mayor for uh, setting it up this way. Every chief in the city is a female. Mayor Strickland did not pick any of those individuals because they were women, but because they were the best and the most qualified. So I think that's really powerful. Um, but the people I reported to previously were all, I mean, they were all men. And there's no way you were gonna say, listen, my daughter is sick, look at her face, you know, it's just like all bright red, she probably is sick. It's like, I'm so sorry to hear that. But it wasn't like we can go home. I mean, so the, it does seem that women are more, uh, not just nurturing, but I mean, they're more sensitive to the needs of their children and the responsibility they have as a parent. And Penelope says, because they're, because we're better. <laughs> uh, we, yeah. Oh, oh, back there, back, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, that way. Yeah, everybody can hear you. Uh, I have a statement, a question with a caveat. Okay. Uh, so my girls are in center race, and I want to just say, my old school be 31. I just want to say that that work life balance is a farce. And that's an opinion. <coughs> it's about harmony. Some keys in our life, as the season goes, play louder than the others. So, and that's okay. that Whitney goes back and has a good time in New Orleans? Yeah. Versus... I would go to New Orleans or Disney. <laughs> that would be my choice. Yeah. I was prepared to answer where I would give it or how I would invest <laughs> it. It, was, it didn't involve me until you did that caveat. I guess I would probably, like theoretically, it'd be a lot of money that you're giving me, I'm assuming. Um, so it'd be, I would buy a house by a, a mountain that also has some source of water for, then, and a private jet to fly me there so that I could take <laughs> my friends and family. But, it, but I love the mountains and there's none near us. So that would be, that would be for me, but also I would invite people. Um, this, is not, this is not an answer to your, or my response to your question is not a, the question you're asking, um, or the answer is not the question you're asking. What I love is time. I mean, I find that time is the most priceless thing that I have, and it's hard to find time. And, you know, I have a lot of friends, and there's nothing better than being with my unicorn girls or, you know, just doing anything small. I'm just really in a phase of, like, enjoying the little things because they really, I'm very sentimental, and those are the things that mean the most. So being able to, so it's, it's not a money thing. I mean, sometimes, you know, you might have to take a plane, so that might bring some bring You can some come on dollars. my plane when I buy it. Yeah. <laughs> With the I'll money she's giving me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can come yeah. too. You can all yeah. come, I'll, it'll yes. be a big plane. <laughs> But Whitney, I, I made a joke, but what, what Oh, would no, you? I would go to New Orleans or Disney. <laughs> I love Disney. We try to, yeah, that's my happy place. I would go to Disney. Um, yeah. That's my well, let us know when. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> We're running out of time. Um, I think we'll do is, uh, you, you can ask questions. Uh, again, there's w wine and food in the back. You might help facilitate the speakers if they do want a glass of wine or food uh, get, to get back there. But um, thank both of you, all, both of you. All three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all for being here. We'll uh, see you around.